availed yourself. Um, I also conclude, I guess, that you have less uh, familiarity with magnetics than with the electronics part <laughs> of the course. Um, so I don't know. We have any questions about it or? Nothing to say. Yeah. yeah. For the, the last part of the grad problem where we had to figure out the relationships between the air gaps to make the, yes. the delta I go to zero. Right. Uh, a couple of us did in different ways and uh, the way we did it was to take the, the equations where like V1 is equal to L11 I prime plus L12 I2 prime and then V2 is equal to the the other equation and then use algebra to simplify it past there and what we ended up with was getting that the middle air gap our, our R2 or something like that had to be zero and yeah okay <laughs> I don't think the gap should be zero yeah, to get zero <laughs> um, well, what was, I was just so ask, the so what you're I mean what you're generally explaining I think is generally okay, except for the last part of what answer you got. So I'm not sure what exactly, where exactly you went wrong. Um, the the result there, to get zero ripple, it depends on the fact that the same voltage waveform is applied to both windings by the converter. So you could say V1 equals V2. And N1 equals N2. Yeah, well, in you could change N1 and N2, but you could make N1 equals N2 as well. If you change it, you have to change the gap. But there's a formula that relates the gap and the turns. And there's a certain condition that if it's solved, you get this zero ripple. Um, what the way I would explain it is that you have the matrix equation, that yeah. voltage equals inductance matrix times di dt solve for di dt. Yeah. So inverse of inductance matrix times the two voltages and the two voltages are the same. And it depends on the two voltages being the same. So di 2 dt is a function of both voltages and all the inductances. That's the approach that we took. Okay. Yeah. And then you should be able to, s there is a, um, you can, you can get di 2 dt to go to zero by with a certain choice of L11, L12, and L22, which then translates into a certain relationship between the gaps and the turns. Yeah. Okay. Let's check the solution. What's different about this compared to the usual transformer is that in the usual transformer, you apply a voltage on the input and you load the output. Here we're applying voltage to both windings and we're finding the currents. And so it's a little bit, in that sense, strange. But it's an interesting thing that happens and it happens in any converter that has two inductors that have the same voltage waveform applied. So it works for the SEPIC or a number of other converters also. Yeah, it seems like this was something commonly done. There were a lot of papers written on it that we could find online. <laughs> about how, like, this is the, the way to do coupled inductances. And make yeah, there have been a lot of papers. Errors. Yeah. Those papers generally express this zero ripple condition in terms of the effective turns ratio and the coupling coefficient. Yeah. And uh, I purposely didn't ask for that. <laughs> so instead, it's in terms of this turns ratio and the gaps. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, so the next homework is all about um, calculating losses in inductors. And so there's calculating the, the core loss, the DC copper loss from the DC resistance of the wire, and there's also a problem on proximity loss. Um, and I want to 
get far enough along today that you can do all of those problems. I think we need to finish the proximity loss material in order to do that. Uh, one thing I'll say and maybe remind you about for calculating the core loss, um, if you have some inductor <coughs> that's wound on some core, then um, there's a relationship between the voltage and the flux density. And we know from Faraday's law, V is in AC dB dt. And so we can sketch what B does, just like we sketch what the current does in an inductor. And so if you have a voltage waveform that maybe, you know, goes up and down and does things like this, then uh, <coughs> we can sketch what B does and dB dt from Faraday's law would be 1 over NAC times V of T. So when you apply positive voltage, B of T goes up, and when you apply negative voltage, B goes down, and it has a slope that's given here. So if this is, say, V1, the slope would be V1 over NAC. <coughs> B will have a DC component that depends on the DC component of the current through the inductor. And then it'll have this ripple on top of it that we find from Faraday's law and the applied AC voltage. And just like in the case of the current, we can find a delta I or a delta B, which is the peak to average ripple in the flux density. And what? Two delta B would be the slope uh, times the time. So this is dTS would be that slope times the time dTS. And you can solve for delta B. Now the data sheets for a core manufacturers will give the power loss, the core loss, and it's per unit volume, so they're plotting core loss divided by the area times the path length of the core. And that's plotted versus um, what they call BAC. And these are, they give you log plots at different frequencies. So these plots they give you are for sinusoidal excitation. Now the other logical leap here is that V is not a sine wave here, it's a triangle wave. And so um, in fact the data sheets don't give you enough information to handle highly non-sinusoidal waveforms. They're only plotted for sinusoidal waveforms and we have to just do the best we can. And so you see most people will say that uh, just use delta B in place of BAC. And I would say BAC is the peak value of the sine wave um, on these, these manufacturer's plots. And delta B is the peak value of the AC component here of the waveform. This is not too bad an approximation. It ignores the harmonics and it also, which by ignoring the harmonics, it'll make the loss, the predicted loss less, because we're ignoring harmonics. But on the other hand, the peak value of the triangle wave is more than the peak value of the fundamental component, you know, um, of the waveform. So it's it's overstating the the AC component a little. Also, if you have a triangle wave, then it's not too far off from a sine wave, and the results aren't bad. If you have a highly non-sinusoidal flux density waveform, though, um, this can be way off by a factor of 5 or 10 even. And uh, there's just not enough information to, to calculate it. And actually figuring it out is a science project that can take a long time. So, so that's the state of things. Um, so for the homework, 
this is what I am expecting you to do to be able to sketch the voltage waveforms, draw the flux waveform, find L to B, and estimate the core loss from that in the homework. All right. Um, <clears throat> back to proximity loss. We talked last time about proximity loss where we have a conductor with, say, some current flowing through it. And when current flows through it, um, through this conductor, we get magnetic fields surrounding the, the conductor. So here's some magnetic field lines. that look like that. Okay. And then what happens is, or what we did was we said, okay, what happens when we have an adjacent conductor that's next door, right here, say, to the first conductor, and this, first, this adjacent conductor will have eddy currents induced in it by the magnetic field, and that, those eddy currents will keep the magnetic field from passing through the conductor. They basically reject the field from the conductor. And so what happened is that we get rid of, oh, well, I didn't mean to quite erase everything. But our adjacent conductor will have, it's basically an equal and opposite current on its surface to squeeze those field lines down so that they don't penetrate the conductor. And this is the proximity effect these eddy currents that are rejecting the field from the conductor cause losses of their own, and those losses, if in certain situations, like we saw last time, can be much greater than the loss in the original, of the original current in the original conductor. And so this is the proximity effect. <coughs> So last time we did this um, two-winding transformer example that had three of these conductors for its primary and three for the secondary. The secondary currents, you know, to get the amp turns to balance, the secondary currents are equal to the primary, but it flow in the opposite direction. And what we found was that we got currents on the surfaces that looked like this. Um, <coughs> where the current in layer one induces a proximity effect current on the adjacent surface of layer two. To get the net current in layer two to be I, we had to have two I flowing in the opposite side. And really, this is the only choice we have here is that currents flow on the surfaces because the current won't penetrate the, the center of the winding because of the skin effect. So it flows either on the left surface or the right surface. And we see what the left surface has to be to get the field to cancel and not penetrate the conductor. And that then determines what the current on the right-hand surface is. Um, this, in turn, induces twice the current on the left surface of the third layer and three times on the right surface of the third layer. And we get very high magnetic fields in the middle. Then our secondary, with our secondary, the proximity currents build down until we get back to zero at the outside of the secondary winding. Um, here's a little sketch of the current densities with this exponentially decaying function of distance into the conductor that comes from the skin effect. And basically, we're, um, <coughs> with, with such a distribution of currents, then there are no fields inside the conductors. There are only outside the conductors. But instead, we have all of these eddy currents on the surfaces. We also estimated the loss. And we use this formula that says, if our conductor is much thicker than the skin depth, so that this exponential decay doesn't, this exponential tail doesn't reach all the way across to the other side of the conductor, then um, the, the power loss that we get turns out to be the same as the power loss we would get with a uniform current density into the conductor a distance of one skin depth. 
and it's as if we have a hollow conductor of one skin depth and thickness on each, each surface with nothing in between. So our conductor becomes this, and it, it has this current I flowing in it just on the surface. If you calculate the, the resistance of this, um, just the DC resistance of, of this uh, con narrow conductor, you correctly calculate the loss due to the skin effect um, when the conductors are very thick. So we use that here to add up the power losses that we get in each layer from each of these currents. Um, so the power loss from the first layer has effectively an AC resistance that is the DC resistance scaled by just the width here. So scaled by H over the skin depth. And if we use the if we know the RMS current, we can square it and multiply that resistance to get the power in the first layer and then scale the, the losses in all the other layers. So we call this P1 is the loss from this one. We'll get a P1 from this current because it's the same magnitude as that current. This current on this surface has twice the magnitude, so I squared is four times. We'll get four P1 there. This is three times the current, so square that, we get nine times P1 there, and so on. So we can add up all of these losses, and you get this formula then for the loss in each layer. And uh, the bottom line here is that the loss builds geometrically with the number of layers. Awesome. Yes, uh-huh. Why doesn't the current in, say, the, the layer one wouldn't it be like easier for that to just flow on the outside rather than on the inside? Yeah, why doesn't this current flow over here? Yeah. Um, the best way I can answer that is that the solution for where the current flows is the solution that makes the least energy stored in the magnetic field. It's this principle of minimum energy. And when the current is on the, the surface adjacent to the next layer, the current in the next layer cancels some of the magnetic field. Um, and so there is less energy stored in the magnetic field, and that turns out to be the solution. So what happens is the adjacent conductor attracts the current in the first layer, and it flows on the adjacent surface. Okay, so here's the formula then for the loss in one of these layers, in layer M, where little m here is this layer number. <coughs> and you can sum this series then to find the total loss in all the layers. Add up, you know, sum from M is 1 to capital M, the loss in each layer, and by solving this, what we get is this expression. So capital M here is the total number of layers, and it's just the sum of the, the series. So this is the total loss, then, that we predict in the whole winding. Here's the total loss we would predict if there were no proximity and skin effect. This would just be the resistance, the DC resistance of the wire. And finally, F sub R is the factor by which the proximity effect increases the loss. So it's this quantity divided by this quantity. And it turns out to be this. Okay. So this is a pretty, these are pretty general results. They depend on, or they're valid in the case where the conductor is very thick, and it's much thicker than two skin depths. And in that sense, this is actually the high frequency limit. If you turn your frequency up to a very high number, the loss hits an asymptote equal to this uh, value. Okay, related to this is leakage flux in the windings. And where we want to go next is that we want to figure out what the loss is not in the high frequency limit case. It turns out that um, 
it's good to know the high frequency limit, but the high frequency limit basically wastes the inside of all your conductors. And the best design generally ends up being one in which the winding thickness is, or the layer thickness is close to a skin depth. Um, that's the most efficient design. So the high frequency limit isn't the whole thing we want to know, and unfortunately we, have, we can't make this simple approximation in practice. And so where we're going to go next is we want to figure out um, or learn how to calculate what the proximity loss is in this case where, <coughs> where the layers are not close to one, are not much greater than one skin depth so that we get things that, distributions that look like that and where the exponential tails run into each other. Okay. Getting there requires solving the real equations and solving Maxwell's equations, which I'm going to avoid, but we're going to, we're going to become functional and use the result from that. So to do that, we, we need to talk also about what is the magnetic field that passes through the winding, what we call the leakage flux. Okay, so we have mutual flux. So this is a transformer and there's some primary and secondary turns. We have mutual flux that we've been talking about so far that goes through the core and links both windings. And mutual flux is great, but as far as proximity loss goes, it's not the problem. The problem with proximity loss is what we call the leakage flux that is flux that's going like this, passing through the middle of the windings. And this leakage flux is what is induced in the copper windings, or what induces um, the uh, eddy currents in the windings. So for a given winding geometry and a winding layout, we need to work out what is the, the leakage flux um, and knowing that, then we can calculate the proximity loss in each winding in, in general with some formulas that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so let's assume that each turn carries the same current, I, I, just to make it simple. So these are all primary turns in series, and we'll, for now, it's... it's um, we'll assume the secondary has the same number of turns and it has the same current flowing in the opposite direction just to make the example easy. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to plot the flux, this leakage flux out here in the core as a function of x and y. Is the disposition inside the, the window. And we're also going to assume the core has very large permeability, so it's basically a short circuit magnetically. It has zero reluctance. <clears throat> so how do we find the leak, the fl this leakage flux? Well, to do it, we need to use Maxwell's equations. I'm sorry, we use, we use Ampere's equation, or Ampere's law, and this is good way to explain it. <coughs> Oops. Ampere's law says that the integral of h dot dl around a closed path equals the enclosed current, the current enclosed in the path. Okay, so if we can figure out the path that the flux lines or magnetic field lines take, we can integrate them around the closed loop, and that, that integral actually is equal to the total current enclosed inside the path. So if we take some path, say we had some line, flux line, that actually flowed in this direction, the integral of h dot dl around that path would be equal to however much current is in the middle inside that path, and this is the MMF around the path. Now, what is the MMF in the core, say, on this part of the path? 
average mu, very low reluctance. So if the reluctance is zero, the MMF is flux times reluctance, that's zero also. So the MMF in the core we're going to take to be zero, which means that all of this MMF then is equal to the H times the distance across the air gap part of the path. Okay, so, so what we get then here, we're going to call this F. It's the MMF across the air gap that actually drives flux, leakage flux across the air gap. And that MMF is equal to however much current is enclosed inside the path, which depends on the currents in the windings that are inside this part of the path. Okay, let's go back to the previous slide then. In fact, let's go even one more back. Suppose we apply that rule to this path. How much MMF is there across this air gap? Zero, thank you, because the, the currents cancel. There's two into the board and two out of the board, so there's no MMF to drive flux in this direction. So because of the symmetry of the windings, we, we don't get MMF horizontally in this example. On the other hand, if you go this way, take a path that goes like this, you've got 4i enclosed in that path. So the MMF from here to here, what, the MMF is in, a, what, it's really the enclosed current, which is 4i uh, in this case. And that's equal to this h at this position x, call it x naught, h at position x naught times the distance from here to here, length of the width of the winding here. <coughs> okay, so what we can do is we can, we see that there's no horizontal component of magnetic field, it's only vertical, which makes the analysis simpler. And we can plot what that vertical component of H is, or MMF, as a function of the distance X. So if you, with a path like this, we'll get zero MMF. Once we get past these windings, we'll get four I. Once we go here, we'll get, what, eight I. Then this path will be back to four I. And then that path will be back to zero. Okay? And, and we actually then, it's common in the business to draw what's called an MMF diagram, which is this MMF as a fun function of X. Okay, so we've got zero MMF until we go past the, these four turns. Then we go up to four I. Then when we pass these four more turns, we'll go up to 8i, and we'll go back down to 4i and back down to 0. And that's the MMF diagram. Okay, need to do that on the homework. So this diagram, I think, is on an upcoming slide. There it is. <coughs> and what we often do is simply draw the conductors as, as they're laid out in the, the window of the core, label how much currents there are, and then we can draw an MF, MMF diagram as we pass the, the uh, conductors. Okay, so back to our two-winding transformer example. Here we had layers. Um, we said each layer carried net, net current I. Uh, 
So you can uh, <coughs> draw the MMF diagram and it'll go from zero up to 3i and back down to zero. Um, what this means is that the, the leakage flux flowing here between these layers is proportional to I. The leakage flux between the next two layers is proportional to 2I. And this leakage flux in the middle is proportional to 3I, and so on. And where we have high leakage flux from the high MMF, that's where we have high proximity loss. Okay, um, what really happens, we have already figured out, is that we get these currents on the surface of the windings. And if you draw the MMF diagram that actually corresponds to this, think about our magnetic path that's going like this down the middle of the conductor, it doesn't enclose any current. We don't really get any MMF until we go past the one skin depth worth of current on the surface here, and then we pick up some net current inside our, our path. And then it's interesting to see what happens if we draw our path down the middle of the next conductor. If you look at that, um, we just consider this path. It encloses a net zero current. And so there's no MMF there. And it makes sense because the whole point is that the current on the surface here is driving the magnetic field out of the conductor. So there is no MMF to drive magnetic field up the middle of the conductor. Okay. And so the surface currents are whatever they have to be to always get the MMF to come back to zero in the middle of the conductors. And this is really the only solution that works, um, that drives the current, the field out of, of the conductors. <coughs> so then here's that, what actually happens as far as MMF. And then the magnetic field going in the vertical direction is proportional to the MMF as a function of x. Okay. Here's what happens if you take the same transformer winding but do what's called interleaving, where we make the second layer be secondary rather than primary. So our primary layers are, are each of the odd numbered layers and the even numbered layers are secondary. And if you do that, the MMF diagram does this. It, it never gets any higher than I. So you can see that this makes the um, you know, the MMF lower, the maximum MMF is lower, and it, it will reduce the, the proximity loss as well. And it reduces the leakage flux also. So the currents actually distribute on surfaces like this. Um, and in fact, every single layer has the same total copper loss as the first layer, which is great. So interleaving is a good thing to reduce proximity loss. It's not always so easy to interleave. For example, if we're building a transformer that operates off the utility power line, there are safety requirements that have, say, things like if a 5,000 volt transient comes down the power line, it doesn't get through your transformer doesn't break down the insulation in your transformer and shock the user who's touching the secondary side. Um, so there are these, these safety requirements that mean that you have to put, in many applications, you have to put a lot of insulation between the primary and secondary. And as a result, it's not practical or economical to fully interleave the windings. So what we can do instead is partially interleave. And it's a trade-off then. So here's an example where we're willing to put the pri split the secondary in half and put the primary in the middle. This is also an example where there's a turns ratio. So the secondary doesn't, there's, there's four layers of secondary and three of primary. 
So the currents in the secondary layers are not the same as the primary layers. But you just go draw the MMF diagram just the same. So if we have a path like this, the current enclosed is minus 3 quarters I. So our MMF diagram will go down to minus 3 quarters. And then path around the two layers will give us a net minus 1 and a half I. Okay. And then the primary layer, if we include one primary, we add one, so that brings us up to one ha negative one half I. <coughs> then if we add another one, that brings us up to plus one half I, and so on. Okay, so we just add up the the currents in the layers. But you can see that when we do this, you you can very easily get fractional MMFs. They don't have to be integers, and it depends on the turns ratio or on the ratio of the number of layers and how they're interleaved. <clears throat> okay. So far we've talked about conductors that are shaped like rectangles in cross-section. Um, it's nice to have a conductor like that, but the vast majority of conductors in our transformers are round magnet wire. And so we need to make another approximation. What we want to do is to simplify the geometry before trying to solve Maxwell's equations. We want to approximate round conductors with square or rectangular things like this. So this is a bit an approximation. It's a bit of hand waving, but it's well accepted in the literature and everyone does it. and I, it seems to work. So the approximation is to try to morph the round conductors into an effective rectangular conductor. Okay, so what we're talking about here is one layer in our transformer. And maybe this layer primary actually has some round wire, you know, so many turns of round wire that's in one layer. And what we want to do is lump all those round wires into one effective big con square conductor. So it goes like this. First you take your round wire and turn it into square wire. And we want the square wire to have the same area, to have the same cross-sectional area as the original round wire. So you can do the, do the geometry, figure out what what this h distance is relative to the original wire diameter with the pi r squared function. And you find that h needs to be root pi over 4 times the original diameter. OK, so by doing this, we didn't change the DC resistance of the wire. Next thing we do is we push all these conductor, these square wires together to make one rectangular conductor. And if we have in, turn, in turns here, each carrying current I, then our rectangular conductor we're going to define as having current in I. I'm going to call it in, in L, the number of turns in a layer times I. <coughs> okay, so when you push these square conductors together, you get rid of the spaces between them, and you make a conductor that's not as tall as the original conductor. And so the next thing we do, the last step, is to stretch this conductor back to the original width, like this. Now, the problem with that is that now all of a sudden our conductor has more area than the original conductors had, and so its DC resistance is, lar is lower, and that's not fair. So we need to adjust something to make the DC resistance come out the same. And what's done in the business with this stretching is to apply a fudge factor that is called the porosity. And you can think of it as that your conductor becomes spongy and has holes in it. And there's enough, and these holes are uniformly distributed around the conductor as necessary to make the cross-sectional area of conductor be the same as it was in the original conductor. <coughs> 
and this porosity then is a, really the ratio of the original area to this area. Um, and so we apply this porosity factor that to effectively make the, um, the, the resistivity of the wire higher to get the DC resistance back to where it ought to be. Okay. So eta then here is defined as, it's called the porosity, and here's an expression for it <coughs> in terms of the diameter of the original round wire, the number of turns of round wire in the layer, and this LW, which is the height here of, of the layer. Okay, so this is a porosity fudge factor. Now, by changing the resistance of the wire, you change the skin depth. Because skin depth depends on the resistivity of wire. It goes like square root. So we have an effective skin depth now, delta prime, that is the, the real skin depth divided by the root of the porosity. Okay. <coughs> now, fi so fine, we apply it f the factor to the skin depth also. And finally, what we're going to to use is this factor phi, which is the ratio of the thickness of this effective conductor, this H, um, to the skin depth. That's supposed to be delta. <coughs> Font problem there on that slide. <coughs> so phi is a measure of how thick our effective conductor is relative to the skin depth. And if we use fat conductors, then phi is a big number. And with very thin conductors, less than a skin depth thick, then phi will be less than 1. <laughs> so here is the equation for phi that we will use. And we're going to base all of our results now on, on this phi. So think of this as simply phi is how thick the conductor is relative to a skin depth with a, pro a couple of appropriate fudge factors applied. Okay, so now here's the main result, power loss in a layer. Suppose we have some layer that's rectangular and there's magnetic fields on both sides of the layer and there's current flowing through the layer. Um, what is the power loss in the layer? And we want an equation for this that is valid for any thickness of the layer, not just the high frequency limit. Okay, so we're going to get an equation that's in, given the MMF diagram and given this phi, we can calculate the power loss in the layer. And I'm not going to derive it. It's an exercise in solving Maxwell's equations. But this is the result, and it's a well-known well result called Dowell's equation. two L's. <coughs> so P here is the power loss in the layer. And it's a function of the DC resistance, this phi, and the number of turns in the layer. It's also a function of the MMFs on the two sides of the layer from our MMF diagram. And it's a function of, of this G1 and G2 that are hyperbolic cosines and things, which are fairly hard to tell from looking at them what they are, but not that hard to plug into MATLAB or Excel or MathCAD or your favorite program and evaluate. So basically, we just plug in to this and we can get the power loss in the layer. <coughs> okay, um, one other little thing to do here is that the MMF on the two sides of the conductors, so here's the MMF on one side and the MMF on the other from our MMF diagram. So this was something that maybe, you know, it was doing whatever it was doing. So this value is the MMF on one side. 
and the MMF on the other side. Let's see, it's and draw that right. So from our MMF diagram, we can get the MMFs on the two sides of the layer and plug into Dell's formula. But actually, the difference between them is given by the number of the amount of current in the layer. And what we're going to do is talk about layers Talk, or talk about the ratio between the current in the layer and the MMF at one side of the layer. And it looks like we're going to do it on this side. So if we're going to define that the MMF on the right-hand side of the layer is equal to M times the current in the layer. And this little m was what we were calling the layer number before. <laughs> okay, so if we have a simple winding where you know, the second layer will have m equals 2, but when we start interleaving, m can be other numbers. So if you define it this way, we can actually get rid of these MMFs and just talk about the value of m and rewrite the equation, Dowell's equation, like this, where the power loss is given by this function and this Q prime is this thing that depends on the functions with hyperbolic cosines and things, and it also depends on the value of m, which is defined this way. Okay. Now, one thing you might wonder is why do we choose the right-hand side? Why don't we choose define m with respect to the left-hand side? And the answer is you can define it either way and you get the same answer. And you'll get a different value of m, but when you plug it into Dow's equation, you'll get the same loss in the end. Okay. There's a plot, okay? So this, this is a plot then of the answer. So this, this axis is the, basically the conductor thickness. Thickness divided by the skin depth on this, this axis, or phi, possibly with fudge factors. And then this axis is the factor by which the proximity effect, effect increases the loss over the DC resistance. So this is total loss divided by the loss predicted only by DC resistance. Okay, and so if you have only one layer, here's what happens with when the, with a conductor thickness of one skin depth, the proximity effect increases the loss by this amount, which isn't very much. But when you make the conductor thicker and thicker, the loss goes up relative to the loss predicted by the DC equation. So basically, thick conductors more than one skin depth get a lot of loss. If you have a lot of layers, you know, layer number 15 is getting a lot of loss even with one skin depth of thickness. This is a log scale, so this is two orders of magnitude more loss than you would get in the first layer. Okay, so I drew this one in Excel, and it's just using Excel to plot the hyperbolic cosines and things and evaluate... Um, just this function right here. All right. One thing about this that's not very helpful is that when you make the conductor thicker, the DC loss goes down. This is the plot of loss relative to the loss you get in, in the DC case. But it would be nice to plot the loss just in absolute terms instead of relative to the DC case. That's what this is. So this is the same thing on the horizontal axis, but the vertical axis is actually just the power loss, total loss. And it's actually normalized 
I had to divide by something. So it's divided by the DC loss if you had a conductor of phi equal one or one skin depth thick. But basically, this is just total loss. And what happens when you make your conductor thicker is at first the loss goes down because the DC loss is lower. But at some point, the proximity loss picks up and makes the loss big. And so there's an, actually an optimum thickness that minimizes the loss. And finally, at, at thick conductors, it goes to the high frequency limit that we calculate um, previously. We talked about it at the beginning of the lecture. Okay, we're running out of time, but here's, there's some examples that you're going to have to do on the homework. So draw the MMF diagram, figure out the M for each layer, and then knowing the M on each layer, you can go back here and see its loss for each, its proximity loss for each layer, and then add them all up. And that's what you're going to have to do on the homework. So there are some examples, I guess we'll talk about on Monday, but there's examples of interleaving windings, this partial, partial interleaving finding the M in each layer with this formula, and then plug in that M to the Dowell's equation and calculate the loss in each layer and then add them all up. So there's an example here of calculating M for each layer, which if you're going to do the last problem on the homework, we're going to have to do this. I'll talk some more and come back to this on Monday, I guess. All right, have a good weekend.